Good morning. Let's go to the Lord. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for these that are gathered here in corporate worship. Open our hearts and minds to you. Turn our face to you. Help us to just let all of the daily frustrations and the little distractions that would pull us away from your message dissipate and drain away so that we are 100% solid focused on you and your message. Help us to walk out of here changed, Lord, changed in a way that would cause us to seek the furtherment of your kingdom and to live a life that honors you, that our thoughts would honor you and our lives would glorify you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Elmer Benner describes a bombing run over the German city of Kassel. He says, our B-17, the Tondaleo, was barraged by flak from Nazi anti-aircraft guns. That was not unusual. But on this particular occasion, our gas tanks were hit. Later, I reflected on the miracle of 20 millimeter shell piercings in the fuel tank without touching off an explosion. Our pilot, Bon Fox, told me that it was not quite that simple. On the morning following the raid, Bon had gone down to ask our crew chief for that shell as a souvenir of unbelievable luck. The crew chief told Bon that not just one shell, but 11 had been found in the gas tanks. 11 unexploded shells where only one was sufficient to blast us out of the sky. It was as if the sea had been parted for us. Even after 35 years, so awesome an event leaves me shaken, especially after I heard the rest of the story from Bond. He was told that the shells had been sent to the armorers to be defused. And the armorers told him that intelligence had picked them up. They couldn't say why at that time. But Bond eventually sought out the answer. Apparently, when the armorers opened each one of the shells, they found no explosive charge in any of them. They were clean as a whistle and just as harmless. Empty? Not all of them. Not all of them. One contained a carefully rolled up piece of paper. On it was a scrawl in Czech. The intelligence people scoured the base for a man who could read Czech. Eventually, they found one to decipher the note. It set us marveling. Translated, the note read, This is all we can do for you now. Folks, we need to understand and realize that although God sovereignly controls all things, He is in control. He is the sovereign Lord of all creation. We are free will beings, and we're engaged, and we're actively involved in His plan, and we need to take action within our scope of control and our scope of authority. We need to take action. So our goal today is to remember that we're responsible for the process of the calling on our lives. But we need to remain surrendered to the final product belonging to God. To better understand what I'm talking about, if you'll turn with me to the book of Ruth, as we continue our study, we're in chapter 2 today of Ruth. I'll begin reading in verse 1 of Ruth chapter 2. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. 
Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink whatever the young men have drawn. And then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Just to keep us in perspective here with the background and history of where we are in the book of Ruth, the text tells us at the beginning of the book that this is taking place during the time of the judges. It's a very dark time in the history of Israel. And what we see there is this downward spiral of, of Israel who turns away from God and they go after other gods and they worship idols and so forth. And as a result of that, God allows the people around them, the countries and, and the peoples around them to overtake them and they oppress them. And when they can stand it no longer, Israel cries out to God. God hears their cries, their pleas, and he sends a deliverer. And things go well for a while and then the spiral continues downward. And we've also read that Naomi, Ruth's mother, loses her husband, and then subsequently she loses both of her sons. And in agrarian society, we learned that, of course, this is complete and utter devastation because they're the providers. They're the ones that would make provision for the family. And so she has no means of income. She has no means of provision. And she is utterly destitute. So as a result of that, Naomi decides that she's going to return to her land, and one of her daughters-in-law, Orpah, decides that she wants to stay with her at first, and then Naomi talks her into leaving, but Ruth will not leave, and Ruth says, I'm going with you, and Ruth returns with Naomi back to Bethlehem. Last week we read that Naomi, upon the return to Bethlehem, goes around everyone, basically crying out, woe is me, have mercy and pity on me. And she's having a big pity party. And so her intentions, originally, she learns that the Lord has blessed the land of, of Israel, and so she's returning there knowing that there's some provision there. But we see the ulterior motive here is to play upon the sympathies of those people who know her in order to get, hopefully, provision from them. And so this week we begin to read about Ruth and her response and her reaction to the circumstances of life. And so if you will, go back to verse 1 with me in chapter 2. This is what a literary device known as preparation. And the reason that when we read Hebrew prose that you see preparation at the beginning of a text is it sets the stage for what's about to happen. If we had just started reading in verse 2, we'd get to the, the verses downward and say, who's this Boaz guy? So the text in verse 1 tells us who Boaz is. He's a relative, a kinsman, as the text tells us, of Elimelech, who is, of course, Naomi's husband, who she's widowed to. And so we see that repetition again in verse 3, that Elimelech is a kinsman of this guy Boaz. And so when you see repetition in the text, there, there's a, it it's kind of throws up a red flag for you to pay attention it's important that Boaz happens to be a relative of this family. So we need to pay attention there. Look at verse 2 with me. Ruth requests that Naomi allow her to go in the fields and glean, which just means to, to go gather what's left, the grain, so that they have something to eat. Now, this is not against anything, any kind of culture that was happening at this time. In fact, that is normal for folks who were in need to be able to go to fields and go behind those, those people gathering the harvest and pick up what was left over so it wouldn't be wasted. And they actually were instructed to leave behind some things for the poor. 
However, you have to remember that this is the time of the judges. And during the time of the judges, people were not, not always, their, their hearts weren't always outwardly focused. They were more inwardly focused. And so what we see happening here is an act of grace on the part of those reapers and leaving behind some things for, for the poor. And you get this very clear picture, my friends, in the text. Another literary device that we look at here is this comparison contrast. And it's a comparison and a contrast of the response of Naomi in comparison to the response of Ruth. Naomi's response is what? Woe is me. Call me Mara because the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. Trying to play on the sympathies of the people around her. And Ruth, what's her response? Hey, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do something about this. You okay with that, Naomi? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take action here, and I'm going to go get us something to eat today. I'm going to take action. Compare some contrast. Do you see that? The response. We talked last week about the response. What's our response to our circumstances? Is our response to cry out and say, whoa, is me? Or is it to say, what actions can I take to resolve the set of circumstances that I'm in? See? Look at verse 3 with me. Notice that the text says that she happened to come to the part of the field owned by Boaz. Happened? You think that's just by happenstance? Not in any way, shape, or form, my friends. God is sovereign. And we know how this plays out. We know that it plays out that, that, that Boaz and, and Ruth come together and they are actually the grandparents of King David and ultimately, as it plays out, part of the, the lineage of Jesus Christ. This is God's master plan, my friends. But I want you to pay close attention to the fact that Ruth's response plays into God's plan. Had she not taken action, had she played out like, like Naomi and said, Whoa, it's me. Now I'll hold up a sign. You know, we'll, work, we'll, we'll, we'll stand here for food or, or what have you. What would have happened? It would have been a completely di different set of circumstances for Naomi and for Ruth in the short run and in the long run. So her actions, her choices, her free will decision to get out there and do something play into God's master plan. You see how that looks. And so look at verse 4 with me. Notice the text says, and behold, if you look at the New American Standard, that's the actual word that's used there, behold, Boaz just happens to be there on the day that Ruth's there. Now, Boaz didn't visit the field every day, my friends. Normally, he was over in Bethlehem. He's not out in the fields, but he just so happened to be there that day. Folks, that's a divine appointment. He is there specifically in the sovereignty of God to see the actions of Ruth and to take her under his wing, folks. It is all in the plan of God's sovereignty. And the definition, if, if I could, is the right of God to do as he wishes with his creation. And this implies that there's really no external influence on God at all, and that he also has the ability to exercise his right according to his will. Now, for being honest, perhaps there has been a point in our spiritual development, maybe early on, where we got some sort of an idea that God just sort of created things and set the world in motion and stepped away, and that we're just kind of in charge with, of what happened. And we can make good choices, and if we do, then things go well for us. And we can make poor choices, and if we do that, then things won't go so well. And if we're being honest, perhaps we, we will drift into that kind of thinking from time to time, particularly when things aren't going well. And we begin to evaluate and think, what have I done wrong? What, what did I do wrong, Lord, that you're causing these set of circumstances to be faulty? Instead of maintaining the understanding that God's plan is bigger than you and I, and we are active participants in that plan, and it doesn't necessarily play out to your favor or to your detriment. It's all about His plan. It's all about what the master plan is and your role in that plan. What a blessing it is. God is sovereign. Psalm 50, verse 1 says this. It says, The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. What does that mean? That, mean that, that means that, that the Lord God is in charge and He determines what happens throughout the day. It's by His bidding. 
If you have your Bibles, I know you're holding your place there at verse 4, and hold your place there and dial up with me, if you will, to Isaiah. It's toward the, the, the back third of the Old Testament. We want to be in Isaiah chapter 40. In Isaiah chapter 40. And I'll just read verse 15 and following. And I want you to just let this text wash over you as it speaks to the sovereign control of the Lord God. You see, the text supports God's sovereignty. This, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust of scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God or what likeness compare with him? An idol, a craftsman casts it and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it for silver, its silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretch out the heaven, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing, and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither. And the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then would you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might. And because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is uncertain. The unsearchable, unfathomable God of the and the creator of all things, my friends, is large and in charge. He oversees all that happens. First Timothy 6.15 reinforces again, He who is the blessed one and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, God sovereignly controls all things. Nevertheless, my friends, you and I have a limited scope of free will. And that free will is a part of his plan. Our, our choices that we would deem to be good choices or our choices that we would deem to be poor choices all play into God's master plan. Even to the point where we can choose to avoid sin. See, as new creations in Christ as beings that are indwelled with the Holy Spirit and have a new nature, we can avoid sin every time. The text tells us, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says it, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the means of escape also, so that you may be able to endure. He'll smash your world with more than you can handle so you can see that you've got to turn your face to Him and depend on Him. But rest assured, my friends, no temptation has overtaken you that He will not provide the means of escape. Make no mistake, my friends, we have a limited amount of free will. It's not unlimited. No one has unlimited free will, but our choices play into God's master plan. We're not robots. But he created you, he knit you together in your mother's womb in a way so that you would be who you are. 
And he created you in the environment that you're born into, in the environment you grew up into, everyone you ever met, who raised you, who influenced you, to become the you that you are, so that you would do what you would do. Amen? Nevertheless, the sovereignty of God plays out in his master plan with laser perfection. Laser. It's not like only the things that we read about here in the text were under God's control. And the rest of the stuff, oh, that's just superfluous stuff. No big deal. Whatever happens there. You think God did that? No, my friends. Martin Luther said this. If God did not bless not one hair, not a solitary wisp of straw would grow. But there would be an end of everything. At the same time, God wants me to take this stance. I would have nothing whatever if I did not plow and sow. God does not want to have success come without work. And yet, I am not to achieve it by my work. He does not want me to sit at home with a loaf, to commit matters to God, and to wait until fried chicken flies into my mouth. That would be tempting God. Proverbs 16, 9 says this. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Sometimes you have to read the original language to get the robustness of this, and so I'll share with you. This word, yahasib, or plans, means to chart a course. If I'm going to chart a course, if I'm going on vacation, if I'm going to drive, I need to chart my course. I need to decide where I'm going. I need to determine what the resources are necessary for me to get there. And I need to determine how I'm going to go about getting there if I'm going to be successful in getting there. If I were to just say, oh, I'm going on vacation, I would jump in the car, didn't fill up the gas tank, didn't pack, didn't get any money out of the bank, and just started driving, would I be successful? Well, you know, maybe. Maybe. A man, Yahasib, his way, plans his way, but the Lord orders his steps. What's to order? If I'm, if I'm ordering things, if I'm going to place things in order, what am I going to do? This comes first, this comes next, this comes next, this comes next. Oh, the Lord orders. Yahim Sa'ado means to establish to determine, to direct. My friends, the Lord is directing your steps. Sometimes when we realize this, my friends, we might get a little grumpy with the Lord when things don't go we, the way we want them to go. Who knows better? You or Him. His way is the best way and He is omnibenevolent. That is one of His perfect qualities, His unlimited qualities. His way is the best way. It's not about you and me. Keep that perspective, my friends, because you see, as, as renewed beings, as regenerated beings, we sometimes get this idea that it's about us, God's elect. And if we're doing the right things, me and you, Lord, here we go. What are you doing, Lord? I mean, I'm serving you. I'm there every time the doors fly open at the church. I'm tithing. <laughs> I'm doing everything you want. Why would you put this in my life? Why would you let that happen? Careful. Careful. It's not about you. But what a blessing it is to be part of this plan. Whatever may come. Whatever may come. Look at verse 5 with me. Here Boaz first noticed and he asks about Ruth. But the context of how he asks about her, of course, the heritage is very important to Israel. That's why they keep these genealogies and so forth. Who, who's, who's are you? That's basically, he's saying, whose house is she from? From where does she come? I don't recognize her. I recognize all the other people here. There's someone new. Who is that? Who does she belong to? And then he finds out who she is. So the foreman in verses 6 and 7, look at those with me. He tells Boaz that this is the Moabite woman who returned from, with Naomi. And you remember when Naomi returned, what was there? There was this hum around the city. Is it, could this be Naomi? And so it was very widespread that everybody said, oh, she's back. Look, so there was a buzz, a hum. 
And so everybody learned of this, and of course Boaz is in this little city of Bethlehem. And he's learned of this. So the foreman relays that Ruth is this Moabite woman, and that she has actually asked permission. She didn't just show up and start gleaning, hoping nobody would notice. Now maybe I'll just kind of mix into the fray here. Nobody will know. No, she asks permission. What an honorable person. You know, when you ask permission for something, there's always a potential of hearing no. <laughs> maybe you've heard that it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Why is that? Because then you've already done it, right? But no, she's honorable and she asks for permission to glean and she gets this permission. Now there's a break here. She's, she's resting. And it, the text isn't clear whether she's at the shelter of the field or whether Boaz went back to Naomi's house to sit down and chat with her. The, the text really isn't clear about that. But look at verses 8 and 9 with me, if you will. Boaz greets Ruth. He gives her the permission to continue to glean and he further promises her protection and he encourages her not to glean anywhere else and basically promises her the men will not mess with you. They won't kick you out. They won't do anything, they won't cause you any harm. And in fact, over and above that, normally that would be sufficient. Over and above that, if you get thirsty, go have some water that, that they pour. Go, free, go ahead and feel free to do that. So he goes over and above. And you see the character of these two people. The character of Boaz and the character of Ruth. They're honorable people. They go the extra distance. They go the extra mile to express the love of God to other people. Honorable, people of good character. Look at verse 10 with me. Ruth's response is this. It's a very normal, ancient Near East response to bow low to the ground. She's not worshiping Boaz. This is just a sign of respect. You know, when we think about bowing down, we think, uh, thou shalt not bow down to other gods. And you think, well, uh, not very honorable if she's worshiping a person. That's not what she's doing. She's just showing respect as a result of his graciousness, you see. Ruth asks him why, why Boaz is being so kind to her. She's like, I'm a, I'm a foreigner. I don't deserve this kind of treatment. I don't deserve it. Let's keep going. Look at verse 11. He shares that he's heard of her kindness to Naomi at the cost of her abandoning her own people and her own gods. He knows what that means. She has abandoned her people. She's abandoned her gods. And remember, your God will be my God, is what Ruth says. She has given her allegiance to the Lord God Almighty, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Boaz says, I, I know that this is no small thing that you've done. You've gone on that very long journey to make sure that Naomi gets back here safely. And you've given up everything for her. And here you are out in the field because you know she's too old to glean for herself. Look at verse 12. Boaz gives Ruth a blessing. He says, The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. He acknowledges that he sees that she has placed her trust in the Lord. And he gives her a blessing. Folks, there is great power in blessing. Let me encourage you to bless those people in your lives. Pray blessings over people. Perhaps you are unaware that I pray blessings over each one of you by name every day. I pray this, pray this prayer and I, I pray this blessing over you. I say, may you be blessed, men and women who fear the Lord. May you find great delight in the Lord's commands. May your children be mighty in the land. Even so, to the next generation, may you and your children be blessed. May you find your wealth and your riches in God. And may you endure in righteousness forever. Even in the darkness, may light dawn on you. May you be a gracious, compassionate, and righteous man or woman. And may your names, and I name you, be remembered by the Lord forever. There is power in blessings, my friends. And I pray blessings over you daily. Know that your pastor prays for you. Because I love you. Let me encourage you to do the same for each other. Verse 13, we'll wrap things up with that. Ruth responds to the blessing really with true humility. Now she admits that, that she doesn't have any way to measure up to the, the bountiful blessings, even 
with the lowest of positions that she's in, she, she said, I don't measure up. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. So back to this comparison contrast here, you know, Naomi's reaction, her response is, what was me? Someone please help me. Please feel sorry for me. Ruth says, I'm going to take action. I'm going to step out and I'm going to take action. And the Lord comes alongside of that and he blesses that. See? So what do we take away from this text? I mean, we're really, we don't get out there and glean in the field, <laughs> do we? No. What do we take away? How do we respond? How shall we respond to the circumstances of life when, the, when, when, when life just throws us a curve? When something hits us that just we really don't expect, perhaps that may even seem devastating. How do we respond? What do we do? What do we do? You have your Bible, so please turn with me to the New Testament. We'll be studying this passage in greater detail next year as we get to Philippians. But if you'll turn with me to Philippians, this really answers the crux of, uh, of what's, what's going on here. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 says this. And this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Philippi. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. I want to qualify this. The text doesn't say work for your salvation. It says work out your salvation. You see, my friends, as, as we are regenerate beings, as we are a new creation in Christ, it is incumbent upon each of us to make our Christian life operational. To take action. To get out there and do. To work out your own salvation with fear and trembling means for you and I to recognize that we are accountable and responsible to grow in Christ for the purpose of being a light in the dark place. For the purpose of being the example. Like the Apostle Paul says, in as much as I resemble Christ, resemble me. That's discipleship, my friends. The Apostle Paul models Christ and he says, model yourself after me in the same way that I model Christ. You see how that works? Discipleship, my friends, is the way that you and I grow. We're taking action for our own growth as a believer, knowing that it is God who will work in us, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Immediately when we dive in, and particularly as we experience spiritual growth, we begin to see results and we begin to see things happening in our lives and we begin to look backward and see where we've come from and perhaps we look forward and see that there's so much further to go and so we begin to plan our way and we forget that it's the Lord that orders our steps. And so my friends, let me remind you that you and I are responsible for the process of our spiritual growth and for the spiritual growth of those who have voluntarily arranged themselves under us as disciples, we are responsible for the process, but the product belongs solely to God. The minute that we begin to picture in our mind's eye how things should turn out, we err. Stay the course, my friends, and remember, the product belongs to God. And what a beautiful product that is. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father.